Um, yeah, so as you might have guessed from the song that we just had and the fact that it says faith up there, I'm going to be doing a talk on faithfulness. And kind of one of the ideas we kind of, when we decided who was going to do which talks, was we kind of took a fruit of the spirit that we kind of struggled with or found a bit hard. And for me, that's often faith, because although I find that my faith goes in cycles quite often, and a lot of that is generally having a lack of faith either in God's existence or what he can do. Um, before I go properly into faith, I thought as all talks should, I'd start off with some examples of faith that are kind of more outside of the Christian sphere. And I remember from the first the first um, talk that we had with Mark this week when he introduced the spirit, fruit of the spirit, um, when he was talking of faith, um, I guess because I'm part of my life and that kind of thing, I had this idea of just this image of birds leaving the nest for the first time when they don't know if they can fly because they've never tried it before. And basically they're just going to push out the nest by the pair of birds and just have to flop their wings and hope they have faith that they do fly. And I found a really cool clip on the internet of these guillemots from Frozen Planet where they first take the first flight. But unfortunately the first bird kind of flaps a bit, goes, goes, doesn't quite get the hang of it, plummets down, crash lands on the beach and gets eaten by a fox. <laughs> so, I, I didn't know if that was the best video to start off with. So, I have got it, so we can watch it later. But, um, maybe not for now. So then I kind of got on thinking of times in my life when I've like, had strong, like, leapt, stepped out in faith. And the most literal example I could think of was doing a bungee jump. Because you do literally step out in faith that the rope will hold you. And, Again, it's probably not the best example because the bungee jump I did was in the news recently because uh, it's the one where the rope snapped. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I'd done it about four years previously and the rope was looking pretty, pretty warm then. So that's possibly more an example of stupidity than faith. So then I thought of just like times in my life when there's big, big changes and upheavals. I thought of moving to Northampton when I. I moved here, I didn't know anyone, didn't know where Northampton was before I moved here. So I kind of thought, I'll get like a house share and then at least I'll have some friends from the start. So I looked around a few houses in the first few days and they were all really ropey and not very nice. And then the last day I was looking around and found one that was really nice. The landlord was like, oh yeah, you'll get on really well with the other housemates, you've got loads in common, it'll be great. So I was like, okay, well, I might as well move in. I did pray about it. I didn't wait for a response to my prayer, which is possibly <laughs> where I went wrong. Um, so yeah, and then I met them all in the first evening, and I've never had less in common with anyone <laughs> in my life. It was me alongside a kind of a 50-year-old couple who just moved back from a failed emigration attempt to Bulgaria. <laughs> <laughs> when after a few weeks they figured that not speaking any Bulgarian was going to be a problem. So didn't have much in common with them. There was uh, a Filipino nurse who didn't really speak English and worked night shifts. And there was a guy called Tim who was into heavy metal and basically lived at his girlfriends. So again, I guess, I guess, I guess it's about having the right kind of faith, and it's possibly when you pray, it's not just the praying; it's maybe listening to the response to prayer as well. And maybe most of all, it says that faith isn't necessarily about the really big step out moments in faith. But actually, it's more important to have a constant, any kind of amount of faith. And one of the sort of famous verses from the Bible is, um, if you've got faith as small as mustard seed, you can say the tree, be it rooted and thrown into the sea, and it will obey you. And, not that's going to work. That's, that's how big a mustard seed is, which is pretty tiny. And it's kind of saying all about that, it's just, it's about having some form of faith and letting God do the rest that's important. Um, so before I talk any more about what I think about faith, um, I'll tell you, get you guys to do it on your tables and we'll have like five or so minutes just to discuss these questions because maybe I'm not the best person to be talking about faith. So, um, yeah, discuss those in your groups and then I'll carry on my talk in about five or ten minutes. Okay, are we ready to, to carry on? Um, I wasn't necessarily going to go around every table and make people say stuff, but if you do have anything from the discussion, do you want to share with the group? You can do so. Be don't. Well, I should carry on talking. <laughs> um, so, as Rocky pointed out, one of the best 
descriptions of the Open Bible as a new piece, and it's vague as being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And another quote I heard recently from the Bishop of Canterbury was that certainty is the opposite of faith. And kind of, some people agree with that, some people don't, um, if you don't argue with the Bishop. But kind of, to me, it, it did speak quite a lot that, yeah, faith, faith is never certain because that's what faith is. You've always got to have some kind of step where you go from certainty to stepping into faith and, and believing. And it's, yeah, it's a lot about, as that quote says from Hebrews, faith is a lot about hope. And I remember while ago when Dad did his talk, he was saying, why isn't hope one of the fruits of the Spirit? And maybe because it's so entwined in faith and you can't have one thing with the other, but you only need faith as a fruit because basically without hope there's no faith, without faith there's no hope. And if, <laughs> if faith is the opposite of certainty, and if the bishop is saying that maybe he's not always certain, then maybe everyone does, or everyone does, have doubts about their faith, and that is normal. And if you look through the Bible, there's loads of examples of Paul had the occasional doubts, Jesus on the cross, maybe not doubts, but kind of like shouting out to God. Um, and one of my favourite examples is Thomas, who says, when Jesus has um, been resurrected, he appears to all the others, but not Thomas, and Thomas comes in and they're like, oh, we've seen him, and he's... Maybe that's just a reflection of what Thomas thought about his friends, but who knows. But he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand inside, I will not believe it. I think a lot of the time we do feel like that, that why can't God just appear and we know for sure that he's there. But I guess if he did that, it would be faith. And I'm not sure if he did that once, then for the rest of our lives, we would be like, okay, it's our sword and we'd be completely faithful. We'd probably go... Actually, can you do it sort of once a year and then once a month and then it starts becoming faith, doesn't it? And quite often I think that um, in these times of doubt, we do often learn a lot about God. It's depending on what we're doubting, we often kind of discuss it with friends, we read about it, sometimes we even pray more when we're doubting God because we're kind of angry at him when he's not done something. And yeah, I think God really uses uses those times to, to grow us in faith. And I think that's something that we don't often allow for in church, that people are going through various kind of situations where they're doubting what God can do or doubting God himself. And I know there's definitely times I go to church and the last thing I want to do is to like walk in and do some happy, clappy kind of worship. Because um, I just really don't feel like it. I think it's probably an opportunity to have some kind of some different style of worship songs. It'd be great if we could sing some songs that were like, life's a bit crap at the moment, but I'm sure God will sort it out eventually at some point, but I'm not really sure when. Um, it's a market for that, it's a grumpy worship. Yeah, I think there is, if Radiohead did worship songs. <laughs> <laughs> but even biblically, like, we get a lot of our worship songs from the Psalms, and a lot of the Psalms are just angry tirades at God, and we never seem to use them, so. <laughs> Yeah, if someone could work on it, that would be great. But it kind, of, it kind of proves that it is normal. It's been happening all the way through the Bible. People have had this up and down relationship with their faith. But moving on back onto what faith is, um, Romans 3, 7 says, Our faithfulness is a response to, to God's, which is constant. It never gives up on us. And that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why we can have faith, because we know God is constantly there having faith back towards us. And 1 Corinthians 1, 8 9 says that God enables us to be faithful. And we just have we just have to allow him to do that. Because like I said, he's constant, he's always there. And I guess Jesus, in, in a way he died for sin, more he died for our unfaithfulness. Because we keep on turning our back on God. Through, it's happened so through the Old Testament and it happens today. And God basically sent Jesus because we're unfaithful, we seem unable to just have a constant faith in him, we're always turning away and disbelieving or doing something. It's probably God got to the stage where he's banging his head against a, I don't know if you have brick walls in heaven, if they did, <laughs> he's just kind of banging his head against a brick wall and he's like, all right, so I'll sort this out. And, yeah, and sent Jesus and that kind of, it makes it a lot, a lot easier to us because we have Jesus that we can turn to, to to help us through all those hard situations. And so moving on to the question before of um, growing in faith, we can do this, and we can do it in two ways, which I'll come on to in more detail later, but 
We do it by understanding our faith more and also by stepping out. And it's often that we need to take the first step. Um, but back to faith. Faith is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Um, faith never comes on its own. Um, a kind of, che well, really cheesy, but memorable way to remember this is like, faith is like the core of the other fruits of the Spirit. So if patience is an apple, faith is the core, it's the middle of it. You can't have one really without the other. Um, for two reasons, really, because faith on its own can be really dangerous. If you think, just not faithful, faith, regardless of what they're faithful in, some of the most faithful people to their own causes and ideas in history are people like dictators and football fans, and that combination <laughs> is not a good one. And, yeah, so faith on its own can be dangerous, or if you couple it with the wrong values, if you're faithfully angry or bitter or cynical or envious, then that's really not a good way to live, and it's not going to be a good way for the people around you either. So basically, to get the most out, to get anything out of faith, really, you need to link it to one of God's one of God's values or one of its fruits, and that way we'll get the full benefit. So faith really is more about it's more about how we use it. It's not just having it. And I think if you do when you get to the gates of heaven, it, the questions are more likely to be along the lines of what you did with your faith, not kind of how much you you stored up in the bank. And so I was going to look at um, faith alongside two other fruits of the spirit. Um, the first one is faith alongside uh, love and kindness. And love and kindness, they aren't easy, because generally people, people can be hard to love. And we behave, generally we behave out of what we believe. So if we've got a faithfully loving, kind heart, and then that's kind of often what our actions will be. Whereas if we've got a faithfully cynical heart, then that's kind of the kind of person we're going to be. And so sort of being loved, being loving and being kind often comes back to repentance because we're always going to get to the stage where we haven't been loving to someone and we generally have to we have to repent and start again and we have to have faith in God that he will help us to just get get through that and start again and often God is well generally God is a lot better at forgiving us than we are at forgiving ourselves I guess he's had more practice and I guess that's something that we've got to work on too I know sort of particularly for me um, one, of the, one of the issues I have well, some of the people that I find hard sometimes to love uh, like my family and people at work, people I see really often, and people I, who I see so often that they're, they're kind of general characteristics or traits, or they, they have things that annoy me just because I, I know them so well. And I was sort of thinking today as I'm trying to work, there's going to be things that people would do today that I know would annoy me, just their general characteristics, and I can either let it annoy me and that'll put me in a bad mood, and then that'll, my bad mood will not properly produce love and kindness, or I can kind of ignore it and know that it's coming and just let it wash over me and I'll have a better day, I'll have a better day. And it's all about starting fresh each time and having the faith to go back to God. And how we do that is through prayer, through just chilling and spending time with God, asking and most importantly listening, listening to God and letting him guide us through all these situations and letting him fill our hearts with, with love and kindness. And all the other fruit spirits such as patience and such as joy. Another fruit of the Spirit um, that links really well with faith is temptation. Because temptation is all around us, but also God is all around us, offering us a way out. Because he's really faithful and we should really take an example of that. Um, one of the great examples of this in the Bible is the book of Hosea. Has anyone not read the book of Hosea? Because <laughs> I haven't read it either, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> but apparently, <laughs> this is what it's about. It parables the adulterous relationship of Israel, who were whatever God did for them, they always ended up going off and pursuing other gods. And the story is that Hosea, who was a prophet back in the Old Testament, his wife, um, his wife goes off, gets herself into an adulterous re relationship, and then moves on to a bit of prostitution. And eventually, she hits rock bottom. But Hosea just remains faithful to her, and at the time she hits rock bottom, he buys her back, not as a slave, but um, reinstates her as his wife. So he's never given up on her, he doesn't give up on her then, despite whatever she's done. And it's parables, what God does to us, that whatever, however unfaithful, what we get tempted with and we turn away from God, he's brought us back through Jesus and he's, it doesn't matter what we do, he never gives up on us. So if anyone, that inspires anyone to read Hosea, then um, let me know if it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Moving on to growing and persevering in faith. Hopefully, from the discussion that you had before, you all decided that um, growing in faith is a, or getting more faith is a good thing. And yeah, I agree with that piece generally. But sometimes it's it's quite hard. When life's really crap, it's really easy to turn away from God. And that's something that we sort of, we need to be able to work through. And I guess if you ask everyone here at the moment, what's what's their relationship like with God? What does God mean in their lives? Some people will be on the sort of spectrum of God's amazing, he's doing this, it's brilliant. And some people will be more on the spectrum of well, it's kind of better than the alternative of not believing in God, and it gives gives my life some kind of reason. But everyone, hopefully, has got some degree of faith there, and will hopefully head towards the other end of the spectrum at some point. And God's love to us is constant and faithful. It's the same um, when our life's good and when it's bad. And when our life's not going so well, it can be really hard to remember that, to acknowledge that. But we just need to be able to persevere in our faith and have that trust and have that hope. And a lot of the time, a lot of the times it's hard is when we don't know the sort of the when and the why of what's going on in our life. It can be hard to see things maybe from God's perspective. And that's possibly one of the problems of having an omnipotent God is that time is less of an issue for him than it is for us. And but a lot of that time is when he's teaching us to be maybe to be patient or maybe to be trusting. And like I said before, it's it's through these hard times that God does teach us. And yeah, going back to Pete Gregg again, the, from the when we went away to Centre Park's weekend, one of his quotes that really stuck with me is that life's a bitch, but God is great. <laughs> and that can be, it's very true and very relevant. And sometimes we find it hard not to, not to separate those two. And sometimes we think when life's a bit rubbish, that's because God's not doing much. And when life's great, that's because God's doing stuff. And it's really, it's really easy to, to have a faith that's based on our emo emotions rather than a faith that's based on a constant knowledge or a constant trust or a constant hope in God. So, um, a few of the ways that we can grow and persevere in faith are these. The um, first one is experience. Um, we should always be able to reflect and recall and look back at the times in our life when God has been faithful to us, when he's answered prayers or when good things have happened. And we should be, if we should look back at these and recall them, and that will help us to get through some of the tough times. I guess an example for me of this is recently I was kind of we were, um, part of an accountability prayer trip with kind of thing, and we met up in January and we were just sort of chatting through how life how life was going at the moment and I was feeling really low at that time because I was kind of feeling really ill and I couldn't, doctors couldn't find out what was wrong and it just kind of didn't seem like it was going to end it and, and James was asking me like so like, apart from that how's life how's work and I was like oh yeah no work's going work's going really well and it's like and so how's like Family and stuff like that. Family relationships going well, like stuff outside of work. Yeah, my friends, that's going well. How's, how's life overall? Crap. And looking back, <laughs> I was like, I just couldn't separate that one thing from the rest of it and realise that actually there was loads of stuff that God was doing in my life that was good. And looking back now, it's quite funny, but at the time, it's kind of just showing us that you really should be able to, to you forget sometimes all the good stuff that God does in your life and you just concentrate on the things that aren't going so well. Um, second on my list I've got here is prayer, and that's my first example from the start of moving moving house. Prayer is really important, but it's not about praying, it's also about listening to God and spending that time to let him. Because he says he will grow, in the Bible says he will grow in faith if we let him, so we've just got to spend time with him in prayer and listening as well. And basically if we don't pray, then we can't complain that God hasn't answered our prayer, so it's worth a shot. The Bible is actually a really great resource for looking into faith. Because the Bible is basically story after story after story of people messing up in their faith, in their life. God sorted them out, setting them on the right path, and then they're messing up again. I mean, you go through it all from David to the disciples to the Egyptians. It's basically, whatever crisis you're going through, God has seen it before, and probably in a much more dramatic way. I, mean, I love the Egyptians, they're in slavery, God gets, does all these miracles, he gets them out, they get to a sea, he parts the waves, they cross it, he goes into a desert, he promises them Christ land, they need some food, he provides some manna from heaven, and then they like start moaning that the manna doesn't have enough flavours, and they start <laughs> building their own gods out of gold, and so yeah, God has seen it all before, and 
whatever situation you're in, if you look into the Bible, find a, you can find a story where somebody else has been through something similar, you can learn a lot from what, how God resolved it for them. Possibly the most important way of growing and persevering in faith is having support, having friends around you. And Jesus had, Jesus had his disciples with him who were getting through some of the hard times. God's got his trinity, I'm not sure that really works as an example. Noah, Noah had his family and the entire world of creation in his boat as well at his hardest time. So, yeah, and I've found that really much in my life as well, that sort of having a, having a prayer, accountability, where you can discuss things and just support each other when you're having a hard time, when you're not quite sure about your faith, is really, really vital. I'd really encourage you, if you haven't got that kind of relationship with some of another Christian, then, to really have that. And fifthly, um, having faith, it kind of sounds odd that that's there, but it's, it's back to the mustard seed and the need to often to step out and take the first step. And If you take, you're willing to take that step and you're willing to turn to God, then you'll find that he will really reward you in, in growing you in faith. So that's kind of all I've got to say about faith for now. I was then going to move into a bit of prayer and discussion and stuff time. But I don't know, is this a good time to show the video of the Game Lots before we go into prayer and stuff? Does anyone want to see that? They are among the most numerous seabirds of the Northern Hemisphere. This colony alone contains a hundred thousand birds, and there are many more like it all along the Arctic coastline. In just a few weeks, these cliffs will empty. But before the guillemots can leave, their chicks must fledge. Their feathers are now fully formed, but their stubby wings are still too short for them to fly properly. This will be a challenge. It's a 150 meter drop, and they need to make it all the way to the sea. Here he goes. <laughs> he falls short and survives the crash landing. <laughs> the chicks are manna from heaven for an Arctic fox. <laughs> is accompanied by a parent.
Everybody's got a hold on.